So you've been working in Congress since 1981. Yes. That's a little over 30 years, right? Yeah, three decades, and I feel like I just got here. I'm very enthusiastic about the job. Uh, what I find, uh, you know, we do a lot of lawmaking here. I've actually authored, been the prime sponsor of more than 30 laws uh, that deal with homelessness, help uh, disenfranchised people. Uh, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act was a landmark law uh, that created our, our strategy and funding uh, to combat modern day slavery. Uh, I've worked on autism and, and Lyme disease and a whole host of other Alzheimer's disease. Uh, all kinds of disabilities. I've worked to protect the unborn child and the mothers uh, from the violence of abortion. And to me, it's all a matter of government is there to protect those who are at risk, disadvantaged. Um, and so I spent a huge amount of my time working on that. One bill that I'm so happy became law was the Homeless Veterans Assistance Act. A third of all the men and women on the street, mostly men in this case, happen to be veterans. And in 2000, I wrote a law that's still up and running and delivering uh, to try to reach out and get those people back into mainstream society. Very often they have a, a, a chemical dependency of some kind, maybe post-traumatic stress disorder. And um, you know they serve, they serve honorably, and we owe it to them uh, to, to use every resource we have to get them back. So where do you get your value system? Because when I did my research on you, I mean, the plethora of bills that you've passed and submitted and pro proposed um, regarding human rights and um, um, issues regarding violence to, to um, women and children, um, regarding autism, regarding, um, like you said, homeless veterans, regarding even the, the, the initiatives are, the, for instance, the initiative that um, uh, Ben Affleck is working with, uh, the Congo yeah, initiative. Sure, sure. Yes. And um, let's see, let me think here. You, you always uh, remember your resolutions where you remember the, the victims of Tenement Square and things like that. Where does that value system come from? Well, few people have ever asked that. It really comes from my faith. And it comes from the Gospels. Um, I'm a Christian, I'm a Catholic. And there's a, my operating scripture, the one that motivates me the most is when our Lord said, whatever you do to the least of my brethren, you do to me. And the least in terms of circumstances, because we're, we're all equal before God, but people are disadvantaged because of health or disability or some other uh, complicating factor. Uh, so it's all about meeting the needs of people who are at risk, or and it comes right from that scripture, Matthew 25. And, uh, and, and if we do that, it's as if we're doing it to God himself. And it seems to me that's a motivator. You know? And then when you meet people who are in dire need, and you see that all they needed was opportunity in most cases, particularly when it comes to creating jobs and, and um, you know, the, the sky's the limit. I wrote two microcredit lending bills, mm -hmm. which primarily are used in Africa to help people get a small loan, and it's mostly women, as it turns out, and they pay back the loan. Uh, that goes into a revolving fund, so we have more money for lending. And they create these small businesses, five, six people get employed. That's how you build up a country, you do it at the local level. And, uh, and I've actually gone out in Africa and met women who were running these businesses, and that entrepreneurial instinct, that skill, it just has to be unleashed. So what and you're doing now, you're in Congress, let <clears throat> me ask you something to go back a little farther. When you were younger, you grew up in New Jersey? Uh, New Jersey, yes. You grew up in New Jersey. Um, what did you want to be when you grew up? Um, I frankly wanted to go to the, in, into the Navy. I loved boats, and I thought of a career there for a while, uh, or the Coast Guard. Um, I thought of becoming a lawyer, and then I went into business, and um, I'm not doing business, although the Congress is, should be run like a business to some extent. Mm -hmm. And I actually got involved with the Right to Life movement, and from watching the state legislature in action, I used to go and watch the debates, then I became an intern, then I ran somebody else's campaign, I slowly got pulled into political you were life. Young. I was very young. Very young. I got elected to 27, ran to 25, oh, boy. and ran somebody else's campaign to 23. Uh, and even the losses, you know, losing a congressional campaign is very hard, taught me great lessons. And I remember the day I lost, I wrote a press release, because I wrote all my own press releases, I couldn't afford to hire somebody, and it said, Smith, I'll be back. And I handed it out to all the press. One reporter looked at it, laughed, went like this, and put it in the <laughs> file. Um, you know, two years later when I did win, friendly but like, I went back and said, hey, you still throw that in there? Um, Where would you like to see 
America improving on human rights? Well, I think we need a consistent policy domestically that regards the individual, regardless of race, color, creed, disability, uh, as possessing infinite inherent value simply because you're a human being. So, it, it, you know, and, and, and people here in the United States, they wonder why things are so cheap in China. Because they pay 10 to 50 cents per hour. There's no occupation and safety protections for their workers. So uh, what do we do then? Well, I think we need, we need to bring that standard of human rights to our trade policy. We need to bring it. It, need, it can't be a talking point on page 6 of the Secretary of State's list of talking points. It, it ought to be integrated in everything we do, including our trade policy. And it's not. So, so what do I do? Would you, what will the, or can the um, average Joe person, citizen voter do? Well, there's a lot of things, um, you know, there's a big effort, and I'm part of it, uh, to make sure that, that the industries know where they're getting their, their raw materials from. There are a number of places in Africa, for example, where they literally use slave labor and coercion to get um, uh, raw materials. We don't do enough due diligence and we don't prioritize human rights as a country. We, we talk about it tangentially, we don't link it to trade, we don't make it meaningful, and then we enable, you know, when Hu Jintao, the president of China, came in, uh, we thought President Obama and Secretary Clinton was going, were going to raise human rights in a very profound way. They hadn't before and there were indications that they were going to. We know for a fact now that there was no, no real conversation, nothing public. So bad that the Washington Post, after the state dinner with Hu Jintao and President Obama, uh, the Washington Post said, President Obama defends who? Hu Jintao on rights. And we appealed to the president and to the administration, because obviously there are others like the Secretary of State who would raise these issues. Please bring these up. Do it respectfully. But don't let him walk out of here saying, they don't care. It wasn't until Hu Jintao came to Capitol Hill and met with Speaker Boehner and Speaker Pelosi. Boehner brought up the one child per couple policy and religious freedom, as did Speaker, uh, former Speaker Pelosi, who brought up Tibet and other issues. So it wasn't until he got to Capitol Hill that anybody even mentioned human rights. What a missed opportunity. If we're silent on human rights, the bad guys look at that and say, all they care about is trade, making money. They don't care if we put our people in prison, if we don't have uh, labor unions, um, you know, China totally, totally represses its labor union movement. Uh, Wei Jing Shang, the father of the democracy war movement, who I met with when he was let out of prison, when China thought they would get Olympics 2000 just by letting this great human rights activist out of prison. They didn't get it. They got it years later. So they rearrested him and beat him almost to death. He came to my hearing room afterwards and said, you Americans don't understand. When you're tough, transparent, they treat us better in the gulag mm -hmm. because they know they're dealing with people that they respect because they respect someone who's firm and has backbone. When you're kowtowing and like jelly, they beat us more in the prison camp. Supreme Court Justice Scalia once said, if you want to know how I feel about a certain issue, read my opinions. I would add to that, if you want to know how I feel about the issues, read my laws.